labor is being brought from China to work on the uh, railroads, as well as laborers from other parts of Asia, including South Asia, to work on farming. That's going on in the setting of Manifest Destiny and that westward expansion that's happening at that time in US history. We also have a period of time where there are some critical legal cases around citizenship and marriage, uh, those cases concluding that those of Asian descent, those immigrants from Asia, were not allowed to have US citizenship. As the railroad is kind of wrapping up, we have this increase in anti-Asian labor sentiment. And that's a pattern that we're gonna see uh, happen again and again as we look at the history uh, within the Asian American population. So you have this idea that Asians are taking American jobs. This is again occurring in the 1920s. Uh, uh, this is occurring in the 1800s through the early 1900s. Uh, we have the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 that excludes Chinese laborers from entry to the US. It blocks all Chinese immigrants from citizenship. That's expanded in 1917 to the Immigration Act banning immigrants from all of Asia, excluding Japan and the Philippines. And in the next few years, those countries become excluded as well. So we have a complete end to immigration from Asia happening at that time. We then have World War II, uh, Executive Order 9066. We have the internment of Japanese Americans into concentration camps, a term I don't use lightly, but a term that reflects a really dark period of American history. Now we kind of move into wave two. So we're gonna come on up to 1965. We have the passage of the Hart Seller Act, also known as the Immigration and Nationality Act. This act puts an end to immigration policies that are based on ethnicity, race, and quota systems, and it results in a wave of Asian immigration. The focus of these immigration laws are on family reunification. So now you have a lot of spouses and children coming to the US. Uh, as well as kind of that first wave of highly skilled uh, labor that we're gonna see again happen in the 1990s. So you have kind of this, again, wave of doctors, engineers, other kind of highly skilled labor, as well as uh, family reunification. That gets us to kind of another set of wars. Now we're talking about the Vietnam War as we look at wave three. And so now we have a new segment of the population that's coming and that's the relocation of refugees, particularly coming those coming from Southeast Asia. And then highlighting a couple of um, acts of anti-Asian racism. Uh, you have the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982, which is kind of a, again, a pivotal moment as we think about Asian American history. That's happening as the Japanese auto industry is on the rise. And so Vincent Chin, who was a Chinese American, was killed by two white men who thought he was Japanese in Detroit, Michigan, again, in the midst of the Japanese auto industry, and again, I'm hearkening back to that anti-Asian labor sentiment that we saw as far back as the 1800s coming back up again in the 1980s. We have 9-11 that happens in 2001. That triggers a rise in Islamophobia, which really affects those from the South Asian subcontinent. Uh, and you have uh, things such as the murder of Babir Singh Sodi, who is a gas station owner, um, who was Sikh, uh, he was killed by uh, a white man who um, was kind of taking revenge on the attacks of 9-11 and thought he was Muslim because of his turban. Uh, that rise in Islamophobia, which has kind of continued to the present date, we can see as, er as recently uh, as this past year where we had uh, all that talk about the Muslim ban as being something that is kind of still going on. We also have a rise in kind of mass shootings. We have the mass shooting at the Oak Creek Gudwara in Wisconsin. Uh, and most recently, we have the mass shooting of Asian women in Atlanta. 
So that's kind of at our current day. And again, we're seeing this rise in anti-Asian sentiment in the context of COVID. And I'm kind of reminding us all that that is not new, uh, that we have now seen that there have been many periods of time in American history where that anti-Asian racism uh, has been present. All right. So as we think about kind of Asian American identity and where Asian Americans are positioned in this narrative around race, uh, in this paper by Kim from 1999, he talks about how Asian Americans are simultaneously limited in their political and civic voice and presented as an example of success, right? Here they're being positioned as superior to blacks, inferior to whites, but superior to blacks. So they're being presented as an example of success despite being racially minoritized in order to preserve white supremacy. At its core, this is a patronizing practice that maintains white dominance by disregarding the lived experiences of one group. Here we're talking about those effects of anti-Asian racism. You can see here that while Asian Americans are kind of being placed here in the middle of this racial hierarchy, they're also being positioned as the forever foreigner. And that uh, kind of label uh, has really been, I think, critical to how Asian Americans are viewed to the present date. So they're being kind of, uh, we're disregarding that lived experience and then they're being used to shame another group. In this case, they're being used to perpetuate anti-Black racism. And again, I think that's kind of a key facet of thinking about where Asian Americans kind of fit into this conversation. And that takes us to talking about the model minority myth. This term was originally coined in 1966 by William Peterson, who talked about Japanese Americans as having a strong work ethic and family values, hitting them against, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, problem minorities. And you can see here this Time Magazine cover, which is actually from 1987, which again is kind of fueling the positioning of different racial ethnic minority groups. So Asian American, Latinx, African-American indigenous people, uh, kind of placing them in a way that makes them kind of fight over this perception of scarce resources. So there are a couple of issues with this uh, myth. Uh, again, it's really the purpose of this myth, and it's no coincidence that this term originated in the 1960s in the midst of the civil rights movement. So really being able, being used to perpetuate anti-Black racism, right? The idea here being that if you put your head down, work really hard, don't speak up, don't make waves, you can achieve the American dream, right? You can achieve economic and financial success. Some of the additional harms though that come with this falsehood are that it ignores the heterogeneity within the Asian American population. And I'm gonna spend some time as I go through the demographics of this population, highlighting some of that diversity. It also hides some of the inequities as we think about the intersections of race and gender. For example, Asian American Pacific Islander women are paid 85 cents for the dollar. And this reminds me to mention that uh, while Asian American is a particularly broad term, we have the even broader term of AAPI, Asian American and Pacific Islander, kind of grouping people uh, from uh, Pacific Islands, Native Hawaiians kind of into this larger definition. For the, most, uh, for the most part, I'm not going to really be focusing on the Pacific Islander communities when I'm talking about data um, except for the occasional incident, incident, instance where those groups are kind of included. But for the most part, I'm really, again, focusing on kind of East, South, and Southeast Asia. Anyways, Asian Americans make up 13% of working professionals and yet make up only 6% of executive leadership. 
We can see some of that in this figure, which is looking at CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, in this figure, you can see all women CEOs uh, in blue, and then you see the breakdown in terms of Latinx, Asian, and Black CEOs between 2000 and 2020. So we're talking about a 20 year period. There were 10 East Asian, 22 South Asian, 16 Black, 36 Latinx CEOs. I wanna point out that if you look at the Y axis here, this is only going up to seven or 8%. In other words, the reality is that 90% of CEOs are white men. But you can see that as we think about Asian Americans making up a sizable or kind of overrepresentation within the labor market, right, being employed here as 13% of working professionals, when we look at CEOs, we see that they're only at about 2%. And we see similar patterns when we look at academia. So here, this is uh, in this table, you see the statistics for the proportion of um, faculty members at four-year public and private institutions. This is not limited to medicine. And you can see the uh, API um, uh, cohort there in yellow. And I've kind of circled uh, the data for female faculty. Again, I'm highlighting here, Kind of this intersection between race and gender. And we see that as you go up in rank, the proportion really drops to the point that while Asian American women make up 2.9% of the US population, they only make up 2.7% of tenured full professors. So here we're seeing an example of the nuances uh, by race and gender as we look at inequities that Asian Americans face. You can see kind of similar findings as we look at academic medicine. This is data up through 2008. The, uh, in the red bar, you can see data for Asian American faculty. You can see that Asian American faculty make up almost 15% of instructors and assistant professors. And then you see those numbers really start to go down as we go higher up to the point that as of 2008, there were zero Asian American deans. Now, I think it's important to highlight and center these conversations about the Asian American experience within the broader context of particularly anti-Black racism. So as you look at both Latinx and African-American faculty members below that red bar, you see the strikingly low numbers across the board. And I think that again is important to highlight as we're having these conversations. Okay, so keeping some of those kind of historical concepts in mind, now we're gonna kind of turn to talking more about kind of the demographic characteristics of this population. This picture again, reminding you of the diversity that's included as we're talking about this term. So uh, Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial ethnic group in the US, followed by Latinx. You can see since 2000, the Asian population in the US has grown 72%. Uh, Asian Americans are projected to actually become the largest immigrant group in the US by 2055. 59% of the US Asian population is foreign born. And when we look at adults specifically, we see that 73% of the adult US Asian population is foreign born. As we look at Asian American subgroups, we see that the largest subgroup in the US are Chinese Americans at over 5 million, followed by Indian Americans, Filipino Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Korean Americans, and Japanese Americans as kind of the largest subgroups within the US. And as we look at the states that have the largest population of Asian Americans, we can see kind of not surprisingly some of those coastal states, uh, as well as Illinois, Texas, uh, and Washington actually ranks sixth uh, as having the sixth largest number of Asian Americans. As of 2020, there were almost 875,000 Asian Americans uh, living here. 
uh, and the largest subgroups, again, as we're looking at Washington state data, uh, are Chinese, followed by Filipino, Indian, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. So a little bit different than the largest subgroups um, within the US as a whole, but not by much. Now I put in this slide here because I'll say that this actually surprised me when I was reading, um, reading about this and putting together these slides. We really don't talk about Asian Americans when we talk about those with undocumented status. And yet there are 1.7 million undocumented Asians in the US. And here you see a breakdown by state, California by far having the largest number, but Washington is on this list as well as having over 56, almost 57,000 uh, Asians with undocumented status. And as we look at the countries from uh, where this group is coming from, we see that India is actually, uh, has the largest number followed by China, the Philippines and South Korea. As we look at the state of Washington, this is showing uh, the population with undocumented status here. You see 57% of that population is coming from Mexico. Uh, and then you see some of the Asian countries. So 6% from India, 5% from China, including Hong Kong, 4% from the Philippines. Now, as we think about, again, the heterogeneity within the Asian American population, one of the key aspects is income inequality. And of all the racial ethnic groups, Asians have the highest rates of income inequality. And now I'm gonna uh, kind of harken back to that slide about Asian American history, reminding you that we had those different waves. We had the wave post 1965, where you have highly skilled labor that's coming, that uh, kind of, uh, we see that same pattern in the 1990s as the tech industry uh, really ramps up, again, bringing highly skilled workers, particularly from China and India. And we also have that wave where we have relocation of refugees. And what has resulted from that, uh, those waves of immigration are a huge disparity between higher income Asians and lower income Asians. To the point where you can see here at the bottom of the graph in the middle that you have the highest percent change in income, right? So incomes increase the most for higher income Asians and the least for lower income Asians, creating that huge disparity compared to other groups. And you can see that pattern uh, playing out in that figure on the right, where Asians in the top 10% of the income distribution actually earn 10 times as much as Asians in the bottom 10%. And when we look at different Asian American subgroups, you can again see big differences in income level from those groups with a higher median income level to those groups with a lower income level. Here you can see the median income level here for Indian American households being at 100,000 and for Burmese households on the other end being under 40,000. So again, really highlighting this income inequality as kind of a key feature as we think about Asian Americans. I wanna to turn to health insurance coverage, which is a little bit of the opposite story where here we actually see that even compared to immigrants from other parts of the world, immigrants from Asia have pretty high rates of health insurance coverage. You can see considerably higher rates uh, for private health insurance, that's 70% of Asian immigrants having that. And that kind of translates to seeing relatively low or comparable rates in terms of uninsurance. So 8% of uh, Asian immigrants being uninsured, which mirrors uh, the number that we see for the US born population in general. And again, those numbers being much lower uh, than the 20% we see for immigrants from other parts uh, of the US. And as we look at what happened with the uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, you can see that the ACA actually eliminated the insurance coverage gap 
between Asian Americans and whites. So here, Asian Americans are in dark blue, uh, whites are in orange, and then you see the other racial ethnic groups uh, above that. And so you can see how that blue line has really come down um, to under 10%. And I think that highlights how we have more than 77% of Asian American uh, of Asian Americans living in states with Medicaid expansion. So here we really see kind of the positive um, uh, results on this population uh, as we think about the ACA. And so kind of similarly, we see this uh, decrease for all groups uh, as we look at the rates of uninsurance in the context of the ACA. Uh, here we're seeing the different Asian subgroups. So again, you can see that there's some heterogeneity, but all of those groups are under the gray line, which is reflecting rates for the overall US population. Now, I do wanna highlight that in 2020 with COVID, we saw an increase in the unemployment rate for Asian Americans up to 15%, that more than 50% of minority owned businesses are owned by Asian Americans. And again, undocumented immigrants are ineligible for Medicaid. So kind of all of these things together may unfortunately be having some negative effects on this kind of pattern um, that, we see, that we see. And so I think it'll be interesting to see that uh, for data that's coming out now, what's going on with Asian Americans as we look at things like health insurance. All right, so now we get to talk about healthcare outcomes in the context of serious illness with kind of all of that information as kind of a backdrop for now making sense of these data. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this figure. This is kind of a conceptual framework for the different kinds of barriers that translate into inequitable outcomes in the context of serious illness. But I'm showing this to say that I'm going to be focusing on kind of those blue and pink boxes on the right. So I'm gonna be presenting data about uh, end of life care and outcomes. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things in the gray box as we think about kind of the role of uh, culture, um, uh, very briefly, uh, and knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. I'm not going to talk at all about kind of the green boxes. Um, one of the reasons for that being that we really have a lack of uh, research that has focused on those issues for Asian American patients. So let's start with looking at data about the quality of end of life care. And I will just say that one thing I found interesting, again, as I was um, preparing this talk were the number of papers that came out in 2020 or 2021. So I think that highlights that in the current time, we're starting to see an increase in research about this population, but we really have a long way to go. So this is a paper from 2020 uh, that looks at racial differences in end of life care quality between Asian Americans and non-Hispanic whites in the Bay Area. In the gray, dark gray bars, you can see the uh, data for uh, Asian Americans and the lighter gray bars are kind of the data for whites. Uh, and as we look at the odds ratios here, you can see that Asian Americans were more likely to say that they didn't always experience respect for their cultural traditions. They didn't always experience respect for their religious or cultural beliefs. They were more likely to have caregivers who didn't get enough information about what to expect during the last month of life. Uh, and didn't receive the right, were more likely to not receive the right amount of emotional support in the weeks after family members' death. So here we're talking about kind of bereavement support. So you see these differences in almost all of these domains with Asian Americans reporting poor quality end of life care. <clears throat> 
As we look at intensity of end of life care, we see the same patterns that we see for other racial and ethnic minorities with Asian Americans being more likely to receive intensive care. This is looking at Medicare patients who had a hospitalization in the last 30 days of life, data for those decedents between 2000 and 2017. Uh, and here we're looking at rates of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation, the gray solid bar and the gray dashed bar um, representing Medicare fee for service and Medicare Advantage Asian Americans. Again, you see those rates are higher than they are for whites. And that carries through, this is data from the same study. Um, this paper came out in 2021. Uh, and we see similar patterns as we look at some of these other uh, end of life care outcomes. So we see that Asian Americans, and so here in this picture, uh, Medicare fee for service Asians are in the solid gray bar uh, with Medicare Advantage Asians being in that kind of white speckled bar. Uh, so we see that both of those groups being more likely to die in the hospital. We see that those two groups compared to their kind of respective white groups uh, also being more likely to have uh, ICU uh, level care. Again, this is in the last 30 days of life, uh, being less likely to have hospice at death and definitely also being less likely to have hospice enrollment in the last three days of life. And then you actually see some differences when it comes to healthcare transitions in the last three days between Medicare fee-for-service Asians for whom there are slightly higher rates than Medicare fee-for-service whites, but for Medicare Advantage Asians, they're actually lower rates than for Medicare Advantage whites. Again, looking at data from the same study, when you look at them subgroups by disease, again, they broke out cancer, CHF, dementia, and COPD. That solid black bar in the middle uh, being uh, the ratio for invasive mechanical ventilation for whites. Uh, you can see those gray bars on the right uh, being uh, significantly higher for all of those groups with the exception of Medicare Advantage Asians with cancer for whom that odds ratio kind of crosses one. But otherwise for the other groups, we're seeing that same pattern uh, of higher rates uh, of IMV. And they found that both these changes were significant both within hospital as well as between hospital, highlighting the way in which there may be system level effects uh, that are contributing to this pattern. Again, similar findings as we see for African Americans. As we look at uh, rates of hospice use, this is data in the setting of cancer. This is uh, data that's a little bit older. Here you see the breakdown in terms of US born whites, US born Asian Americans, and foreign born Asian Americans in black there. Uh, across these different kinds of uh, cancer, you see the black bars are significantly lower. In other words, foreign-born Asian Americans being uh, much less likely to use hospice across all types. As we look at the odds ratios here, you see that in addition, the differences for US-born Asian Americans are also significant when it comes to lung, colorectal, and gastric cancer. So in, for those three, we see that in addition to foreign-born Asian Americans, even US-born Asian Americans being less likely to enroll in the hospice. Now, this study looked at what happens to hospice referral in the context of an inpatient palliative care consultation. This is data from 2011 from Hawaii. Uh, so they're looking at Asian as well as Pacific Islander. And you see that data that's highlighted in red there. So for those who had a, an inpatient palliative care consult, we actually, if anything, see higher rates of hospice referral and of change in code status to do not resuscitate, even compared to whites. And you see kind of similar patterns for uh, the group of Pacific Islanders. 
suggesting that maybe those patterns that we're seeing in terms of intensity of end of life care aren't necessarily reflective of preferences, right? So it's raising this question of, is this more about communication than it is about uh, inherent cultural values that are consistent with more intensive end of life care? So here we're kind of showing the benefits of palliative care consultation, that if you can elicit people's values and goals, that those preferences are different. And I'm going to kind of stick with that hospice theme for the next slide as I talk about some of these knowledge, attitudes, and belief uh, related data uh, in the context of end of life care. So as I said, kind of sticking with the hospice theme, we see data here that's looking at familiarity and attitudes towards hospice. This is data that's actually looking at Asian American and Hispanic adults. Uh, and so we see they've included the Chinese and Korean uh, subgroups. You see in that top bar that when it comes to having heard of hospice, that it's almost half of Chinese and Korean Americans who've heard of hospice. You can see those numbers, by the way, are much higher than for the um, Hispanic population. And then as you come towards the bottom of this table, when they're talking about, um, would you tell your family members about hospice? And would you like to receive more information about hospice? Again, you're seeing relatively high numbers, 94% of Chinese saying yes, 74% of Korean. I think that this highlights both one, an openness to learning about hospice. Again, that's kind of being reflected in the previous slide where we saw in the setting of a palliative care consult, we saw higher rates of hospice referral. But two, this is again highlighting the differences between different Asian American subgroups. So here, for example, the numbers for Korean Americans being different than the number for Chinese Americans. So again, as we talk about the heterogeneity within the Asian American population, it being important to look at how this plays out for different subgroups uh, to identify differences. And we see something similar as we look at, at advanced care planning. And while there's more data about advanced care planning in individual Asian American subgroups, I found very little data that was looking at the broader Asian American population. So this data from 2010 uh, actually shows Asian Americans as being having a higher odds of having a living will compared to whites, uh, but having a lower odds of having discussed their preferences with family. And you can see that as we look at living will in this study, the rates are pretty low uh, kind of across the board. But in more recent data from 2017, that again kind of broke it down by subgroup, we see again this variance between different Asian American subgroups with the lowest rates of advanced directive completion in this study being in the Korean population at only 5.6% compared to Filipinos having 22.4%. Now, of course, as you're looking at this data, you can see that all of these numbers are relatively low. So I would say as a whole, we're seeing here the Asian American population being relatively less likely to complete advanced directives. But again, there's quite a range as we look at different groups. And as you look towards kind of some of the other data in this table, you can see here that the majority of this sample was foreign born. Uh, you can see kind of the role of acculturation. And I, I draw your attention to the bottom there where it looks at the knowledge of advanced directives as playing a role. So among those who knew what advanced directives were, you have much higher rates of completion, right? 36.6%. So kind of highlighting that important role um, of knowledge and education. And as we look at data uh, related to surrogate decision-making, so here we're talking about completion of designating a substitute decision-maker, uh, data from 2015. Uh, again, here we're looking at the different uh, data broken down by subgroup. 
we see Korean Americans again as having the lowest rates at 8.2. In this study, Indian Americans actually had the highest rates at 31.2. Um, for the most part, they seem to be kind of around 25%, again, except for Korean Americans with kind of a much lower rates. You can also in this table see that for those with uh, English proficiency, um, half uh, of those uh, people um, were likely to have designated um, a surrogate decision maker. So clearly language and acculturation um, as well as time in the US, uh, which is related kind of playing a role uh, in those findings. This slide uh, kind of, I think, highlights that point again about are the differences that we see in intensity of end of life care reflective of preferences or not? Uh, in this study, looking un at uncertainty about advanced care planning treatment preferences, we see that although the sample of Asian Americans is quite small here at 19, but of all the racial ethnic groups, the highest proportion of those who are uncertain about their treatment preferences are Asian Americans at 74%. So I think uh, this kind of further supports the idea that a lot of what we're seeing is actually about kind of ineffective communication um, and kind of missed opportunities to better support these patients in making decisions that align with their values and goals. So I mentioned that I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on the role of cultural beliefs. And that's because I think of all aspects of kind of the Asian American experience, when it comes to serious illness, the majority of literature has focused on cultural beliefs. And so I really wanted to highlight some of these other aspects of data. But I did include this slide. This is actually from my own work uh, where I did a focus group study that was looking at um, uh, South Asian, specifically Indian American experiences between those who had immigrated and the children of those immigrants, so first and second generation. And this quote, as well as the next slide, are just to highlight the complexities when it comes to how these values play out uh, in the context of serious illness. And so this conflict between these strong cultural values and the practical consideration, kind of these realities of living in the US. And so this first generation male uh, says, I feel that my views have completely changed. It's very geographic based. In India, I firmly believed that doctors should not tell the patient. So here we're talking about information disclosure. The reasons were very simple. You could assume the support system. People are going to be there with you to help you. So why tell the patient and whatever limited time that person has and make that time very difficult for him that he's going to die? Here, my decision has completely changed. If I'm here, you better tell me because I've got to take care of, make arrangements for myself. I cannot depend on many people around me. So I put this quote in here because I think it really drives the point that even as we're thinking about cultural beliefs, they don't operate in a vacuum, right? In this case, he's talking about how despite that, you know, practice that is important to him, the practical realities of living in this country in the absence of that extended support system are more important. And so, you know, as we think about these issues, the nuance is so important. And that's highlighted because I couldn't help myself. I had to include a couple more quotes. This is highlighted in, this, um, in these two quotes as well. So now here we have a second generation female, right? 29 year old, who's talking about her grandmother. And she says, so it was diagnosed, I believe this was cancer. Um, it was diagnosed and treated early, but my parents didn't tell her. I still don't judge that decision because it's one of the most paternalistic beliefs I have. I think autonomy is what you want it to be. For some, like a woman who never had any sense of autonomy, not that we should exploit that, but I don't think that was really a concept she valued. In the same way my parents felt a commitment to taking care of her, I think it was okay to do things to make it easier on him. 
on them. They were worried she would give up and then it would be harder to keep her at home. I think she didn't want to take on that burden of knowing everything and making decisions, especially hard decisions. So here, the second generation young woman, still the strength of kind of those cultural values, right? So despite her being born and raised in the US, her concept of autonomy is relational. So thinking of it within the context of kind of what was important to her families. I think it just kind of highlights how in some ways, some of those cultural values are so deeply rooted in how we think about things, uh, almost more so than the first generation who, you know, he's just being really practical. And that uh, comes through in this last quote also, where a different uh, participant says, Sometimes when the near and dear ones have to make a decision, it's heart wrenching. They cannot make the decision because how can you say, just go ahead and kill my mother or go ahead and end life support. Therefore, I feel that the decision should be made by the person whose life basically it is. So while we are in our full senses, while we have a full capacity to think and rationalize, we should make these decisions so that it doesn't become hard for the people around us later to deal with these issues and then nobody gets blamed, right? So here kind of a rationale for advanced care planning. And again, I think the contrast is really interesting. You have this first generation male who's focusing on kind of the benefits of autonomy. You have the second generation female who's kind of highlighting this, but in certain contexts, right? Autonomy is more complicated. So again, I think the point of this slide is, again, just to highlight the nuance as we think about these complicated issues around acculturation, uh, cultural values, preferences, communication. And to, I suppose, get you excited about qualitative research. Okay, so now I'm gonna draw my comments to a close with a couple of kind of brief reflections on kind of what we need to be thinking about as we go forward. I think a key takeaway is we need more data about Asian Americans, definitely in the context of serious illness, and that more data needs to be disaggregated data. So because of those, uh, because of the heterogeneity within the Asian American population, we need to be able to understand which groups are facing which kinds of inequities so that we can develop the right kinds of interventions to address those issues. So more data in general, but that data really needs to be disaggregated. And then coming back to this conceptual framework, um, as I said, I think there's a real opportunity as we look at some of these green boxes, the healthcare mediators, to understand how some of these issues are playing out when it comes to Asian Americans. So for example, I think that there's now a growing focus on research about structural racism, about the role of implicit bias and how that affects decision-making, communication, and the uh, outcomes, uh, patient outcomes. And there's really not much literature on those aspects as we look at the Asian American population. So I think there's a real opportunity to be thinking about some of those issues. And that's where I think, you know, those slides about kind of the experience of Asian American history and kind of Asian American identity kind of make a case for how there may be different issues compared to say what we understand about uh, African American patients. And then as we think about some of these other barriers and kind of the gray boxes here, you know, there's growing literature about the role of language barriers. That's something that I've, you know, um, also spent time uh, talking about and thinking about. As I mentioned, I think there's a fair amount about kind of individual cultural beliefs, but there's clearly room to uh, advance the kinds of work we're doing to better understand how communication and preferences are leading again to those kind of high intensity outcomes we're seeing and how to intervene to ensure that patients are receiving full concordant care. And so 
as I think about kind of the takeaways I want you to have from this talk before I get to my final slide. First, that Asian American is this broad term that encompasses a lot of heterogeneity and that heterogeneity is important to understand, right? Hence the need for more data that's disaggregated to understand the issues for these individual communities. Second of all, that while there is a lot of heterogeneity, there are some common aspects to the Asian American experience, particularly as it is informed by the immigration experiences and conceptualizations of Asian American identity that lend itself to research kind of looking at that broader population. And then third, that there's still a lot of gaps in our understanding about how to improve the quality of care for this population. Okay, so I'm ending on this slide. Um, and this is, I think, maybe this is a nice way to come full circle to Randy's um, uh, announcement of my new role as kind of director of EDI. So I didn't uh, plan that in that way, but it kind of works out. Um, so this is a picture of Malcolm X, uh, a drawing, uh, a painting of Malcolm X and Yuri Kochiyama. Uh, I think I would say an unlikely friendship, uh, but one that highlights opportunities for cross-racial solidarity and the ways in which we can all come together to address issues of equity. And when he was addressing survivors of the Hiroshima atomic bomb, he said, you were bombed and have physical scars. We too have been bombed and you saw some of the scars in our neighborhood. We are constantly hit by the bombs of racism, which are just as devastating. I find this quote to be so powerful because it highlights the way in which one racism is this powerful, um, is powerful in the way it impacts people at kind of every level of life, that our experiences are not the same, that I've been talking about the Asian American experience and it has to be centered within this broader framework of anti-Black racism. And I say that again because I think it's that important to highlight. And yet there are ways in which we can all work together towards this common goal of ensuring that we live in a country where every individual is respected and every individual has kind of equal opportunity to thrive. So again, just to kind of, um, I guess, leave you with that feeling of hope uh, as we look towards the future where we can work together um, to create kind of a more equitable uh, place. All right, so on that note, I'm going to open up for any questions in our last couple of minutes. I know I talked a lot uh, and I'll leave this evaluation slide up um, as well uh, so that people can do that. Thank you, Rashmi. Uh, this is just a wonderful talk, and you know, I appreciate your uh, insights on this issue. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, what we know about the experience of receiving care, uh, and whether there are data that suggests it's important to receive care from people who look like you or who come from the same cultural background as you, uh, and whether we know based on groups anything about that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and it's nice to see you, David. Um, a couple of thoughts. So most of this is outside of palliative care. It's really mostly from, I would say, the primary care and general internal medicine literature. Um, so one, uh, data has really looked at language concordance and not racial concordance when it comes to Asian Americans. So data that for those with limited English proficiency, and so there we're looking at kind of individual Asian American subgroups, that their 
do seem to be improved quality of care kind of metrics for those who receive language concordant care or care from providers who actually speak that language. Um, so that's an area where I think we need to better understand outside of language, uh, kind of the role of racial uh, concordance. Um, uh, so that's one piece of it. And then again, from the general internal medicine literature, we see a lot about how while Asian Americans may not have um, inequitable outcomes in terms of certain clinical outcomes, we see very consistent patterns of lower satisfaction with care. And so I think as we think about some of those quality of care metrics, uh, there's clearly something there. And again, I think that that kind of raises these questions about kind of the effects of racism, implicit bias, trust, that feeling not respected uh, for one's cultural values, uh, that it is probably a lot of that that is driving that consistent research finding. Uh, and again, I think an area that hasn't really been explored in palliative care, but you know, is definitely a finding that we see again, consistently across other literature. I put in so much information, I left you all speechless. Yes, Ashmi, <laughs> this is um, Justin, and I'm one of the palliative care um, chaplains here at the VA. Puget Sound. Do you have a sense of um, any data or insight regarding the spiritual care of Asian Pacific Islanders um, in, in our hospital and hospice and any successes or improvements that can be made with accessing and providing spiritual care? That's a great question, Justin. I mean, I think as we think about Asian Americans and the great kind of diversity in terms of cultural beliefs, we also see diversity in terms of religious and spiritual beliefs. Um, uh, I've really seen very little that's actually looked at that area. I think what I've mostly seen are papers that have talked about what are some of the important religious and spiritual beliefs for different religious groups. I think the data from um, uh, the study that was looking at quality of end-of-life care outcomes at least suggested there, right, that Asian Americans felt that they were less likely to be respected for their religious and spiritual mm. beliefs. So clearly there is a need, but I think it's a need that we don't understand well because there just isn't much out there in terms of kind of data. So I think most of it are kind of your general practices of, you know, um, uh, trying to understand what's important to someone and then kind of providing support, but not kind of specific guidance, I think, um, to address those issues. So I think another gap in our, in our understanding of these issues. Thank you. Great job, Rashmi, that was a terrific talk. Thanks, Randy. Lots of work to be done. Job security. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is good, I suppose. I think we're uh, at time, uh, but I think that was really a terrific uh, talk. So thank you. <laughs>